NASCAR finally admits that Denny Hamlin did jump the restart, plus multiple teams are vying for Stuart Haas Racing's charters. All right, so we'll start off with the hottest topic of the week, and that is Denny Hamlin jumping the final restart at Richmond on Sunday. Obviously, by now, you've all seen the videos where he clearly goes before that restart line, and that's my biggest point of contention here. It's if you're going to have a restart zone, you have to at least police it, and NASCAR didn't in this situation. And I said on Sunday night in my reaction video that if NASCAR has a good explanation for why they didn't call this, I'm all ears. I'm open to hear what the explanation was. And of course, on Tuesday, NASCAR did go on SiriusXM NASCAR like they typically do. And Elton Sawyer, NASCAR senior vice president, did have an explanation for this. Except it felt like a lot of excuses. Take a listen to what Elton had to say real quick. It's a bang bang call, Mike. And as uh, I had the opportunity to look, uh, you know, Sunday night as well as multiple times yesterday. Um, first and foremost, you know, the 11 is the control vehicle. They have they have earned the right to be in that position. They've they've won the battle off pit road. They put themselves in a position to be able to control the restart. And as I looked at it yesterday, again, multiple times, there, there's no doubt he he rolled early. Um, and, you know, again, it's a bang, bang call. It's at the end of the race. Um, you know, we're a live sporting event. We, we don't have the um, luxury of a timeout and, and go to the sideline and review it and, and make that call. Um, if this happens at lap 10 or 50 or 300, um, you know, the, the call could have been different. So um, I wouldn't, if I'm a competitor, I wouldn't be playing that game every week. Uh, sometimes you get the call that goes in your favor. Like I said, for me, it feels like a lot of excuses and NASCAR being like, well, hand up, we missed it, which is fine. I like that they admitted it because there is an old regime of NASCAR that would not have admitted it and would have tried to gaslight us into this. But at the same time, I still feel like I was being gaslit. Just a tiny, tiny little bit here. Obviously, the 11 is a control car. He's earned the right to control the restart. That's what he says. But then he says, no, there's no doubt that he rolled early. Okay, so... We all know that the leader controls the restart, absolutely, within that restart box, once they get to the line. Again, if you're going to have a restart zone, you have to restart there and you have to call the penalties, because if you don't, then what, what's the point of the restart zone at this point? It's just an arbitrary box that's drawn on the racetrack for no reason other than to put Geico sponsorship down there. So at this point, I'm annoyed by that. He also says it's a bang-bang call. We're a live sporting event. We don't have the luxury of a timeout. Yeah, true. And I would believe that, except for the fact that a week and a half ago at Circuit of the Americas in the Xfinity race, you gave Shane Van Gisbergen a 30-second penalty after the race. Because you went back and reviewed it, and you're like, yeah, he gets a 30-second penalty post-race. No reason you couldn't have done that here. Reviewed the restart and been like, yeah, Denny jumped, so he goes to the tail end of the lead lap, which is essentially what his penalty would have been. No reason they can't do that. So that just felt like an excuse to me. And then the one comment that absolutely blew my mind and when I was watching it, I was like, am I insane? Am I going insane right now? This is insanity. I was bonkers this morning. If this happened on lap 10 or 50 or 300, the call could have been different. Why? A rule is a rule. There's no, the rules should not change from lap one to the checker flag. From white flag to checker flag, the rules should be called consistently that entire time. It's like when we go to drafting tracks, especially with the Xfinity series, and NASCAR says, don't lock bumpers. And then on the last lap, everyone locks bumpers, and NASCAR's like, nobody locked bumpers from what we saw. What are you talking about? We all saw it. So you have to call the you have to call the rule consistently. I don't love rules. I don't love that the fact that there's a, there's a lot of rules. But if you're going to have a rule, at least call the rule straight across the board every single time, right? And now a lot of drivers have come out and kind of in support of Denny Halen being like, ah, we don't think he did anything wrong. And that's fine. If the drivers are fine with it, then maybe we're all just stupid and we shouldn't care about what the rule says. But at the same time, if you're going to have a rule and you're going to sometimes call it, you have to call it all the time. I saw Denny Hamlin's crew chief, Chris Gabehart, on Twitter telling people to stop crying. And it's like... <laughs> He used a terrible analogy because his his football analogy is, was essentially like you see the you don't see the refs putting themselves in and making a call that could affect the outcome. I mean, the Rams straight up won a Super Bowl that way. The Chiefs have won a Super Bowl that way. I'm trying to make sure that uh, nope, nobody came up the stairs to murder me. Just my dog, and then that's why I was looking over there. But for the most part, 
call the rules consistently across the board. That's our biggest point of contention here. Just be consistent. And then he goes on to say, if I'm a competitor, I wouldn't be playing that game every week. <sighs> Again, it's not that difficult. You either call the penalty or you get rid of it. At this point, it's just become an arbitrary box in line because we're not going to call it. Yes, Denny Hamlin fired early. Is that a penalty? Sometimes. Well, when? We'll tell you when we see it. It's like the famous John Potter case, U.S. judge. Well, I'll know it when I see it. Well, what does that even mean? We don't know. We have no idea. Ugh, it's very frustrating. I just want NASCAR to be consistent. I think NASCAR has really good people in leadership positions. I think they're headed in the right direction. But race control and decision-making real-time continues to be subpar. It's lackluster. It's the DeVry University of, of race control. It's not good. It's like getting turned down from the University of Kentucky, which is a 98% acceptance rate. I assume those 2% at times are in the booth. And it's really, really frustrating because you just want it to be consistent. All right, moving on to a less controversial topic. That would be Stuart Haas Racing because Legacy Motor Club, 2311 Racing, Trackhouse, and even Junior Motorsports are apparently circling Stuart Haas Racing like a suburban land developer anytime farmland comes up for sale because they want one of Stuart Haas Racing's charters. Teams, according to Sports Business Journal, have identified SHR as a team that is likely to have one, if not two, charters available at the end of the season. Obviously, the deal will probably get done before the end of the season, but you know what I mean. That's really interesting because up to this point, we all kind of talked, speculated that Stuart Haas Racing would be more than likely the one to sell if somebody was going to sell. Well, now it sounds like everybody else believes this as well, which isn't a wild thing, but sometimes you know how the internet is. Everybody gets wrapped up in stuff and they're like, yeah, that's going to happen. It's like, well, is it actually going to happen? Calm down here. Apparently it might. And obviously last year we know Live Fast Motorsports sold their charter to Spire for $40 million. And Stuart Haas Racing is going to get more than that. They just have to really wait for the new revenue uh, deal to get finalized as well as the charter agreement which has to get finalized i don't see i don't see any path forward where teams agree to charters going away i just don't see that happening as much as nascar wants that to go it's just not so sewer house racing is likely going to get somewhere between 40 and 50 million dollars at least for their charters somebody's gonna have to open up the checkbook here make that wire transfer. I don't know when's the last time anybody actually wrote a check. How did Stuart Haas Racing end up in this position? I mean, this is a team that has won two Cup Series championships. They've won 60 races as an organization, 61, I believe, or 62. They're a successful team, but at the end of 2023, they lost a ton, a ton of sponsorship money when both Anheuser-Busch and Smithfield left. When Kevin Harvick departed, Eric Almirola departed, that hurt them on the bottom line. Essentially, I think I broke it down. They lost... 46% of their primary sponsorships from last year going into this year. That's a ton of money to make up across four teams. Combine that with a driver lineup that is really talented. Don't get me wrong. I think that they have really talented drivers over there. They're just not developed enough or successful enough in their careers yet to warrant selling big time sponsorships on them. They've been a pleasant surprise. Josh Berry has been, the, he's quickly become the leader at Stuart House Racing. Noah Gragson, easily P2 over there. Chase Briscoe won that 2022 Phoenix race in the Cup Series. And then I we haven't heard from him since other than when he runs into the leader and then gets out and is like, I hate to race that way, but continues to do it. And then Ryan Priest just exists at this point. Outside of that poll at Martinsville last year, I, I don't know where else this guy has, has been. So all of that combined, and then they're in the contract year with Ford. And Ford doesn't really seem like they want them to continue on as a tier one Ford team, at least not with four cars. And Chevy and Toyota certainly don't seem like they want to take on four cars as a tier one team. And they're kind of left in this weird spot now. But in selling out, they could potentially net themselves $100 million in charter sales, which is certainly nice for both of them as they continue to seem to care more about their interests outside of NASCAR than their interests inside of NASCAR, which is totally fine. So talking about the teams that have been rumored, for this, obviously, you have 2311. We know that they have huge aspirations. Michael Jordan, Denny Hamlin, and the partners over there want this to become a championship contending team. They are contending. A championship winning team. Adding a third charter just makes sense for them. They can go out and find another driver, whether that be like Tyler Reddick outside the TRD pipeline or another spot for TRD to be able to put one of their drivers. 2311 landing one makes a lot of sense. And they also opened up that new shop. As well. Sorry. They also opened up Airspeed as well 
And then you have Trackhouse. We already know Trackhouse has four cup drivers under contract and only two charters. They can solve part of their issue by figuring out what they're going to do with Daniel Suarez. And if they go down to three drivers, landing a charter solves all of their problems. Don't have to figure that out. They keep Daniel Suarez. Then they need to figure out how to get another charter in there and also keep a partnership with Spire or somebody else going along to try to keep all parties involved happy. But right now, they got to figure that out. And we'll see. They had the opportunity to buy the Live Fast Charter at the end of last year, passed on it. So we'll see what happens this year. And then you have Legacy Motor Club. This one's kind of a surprise to me. Jimmy Johnson finally has all his people in place this year. He has two drivers that he likes. Sorry, Noah Gragson. And TRD seems to be in good standing with them. It would be a perfect spot to put Corey Heim if they were going to get it, since little Joffrey Gibbs doesn't want him over at JGR, it sounds like. So having him go there makes sense. And it would also help Legacy Motor Club, again, become a three-car team, especially if this NASCAR revenue deal goes through and the way it works out in the team's favor. Having three cars is going to be better than having two cars as well. And then the topic of Dale Jr. and Jr. Motorsports comes up every time charters come up. And honestly, I don't see this happening. If he didn't buy charters when he could have for $3 million a piece, he's not going to buy one at $40 million or $50 million without some sort of equity partner coming in. The whole business model at JRM relies on drivers bringing funding with them, and they just don't have that. There's not a cup driver that can come along with that level of funding right now, at least not one to help kind of offset the initial upstart expenses. And I just don't think Dale and Kelly want to take on that level of spend right now. So that one just to me doesn't make a lot of sense. Could they buy into? Who knows? Maybe. We'll have to wait and see on that. But that seems to be all the talk right now is whether or not SHR is going to sell a charter. Are they not going to sell a charter? We'll have to wait and see. But for now, it seems like it's a real possibility. So let me know in the comments what you think about the SHR potential charter sale, as well as NASCAR's comments on Denny. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard, Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.